those I think ready for us and then we'll begin so do you mind standing one more time okay I'm so sorry <laughs> the older we get the harder it is I tell you hey, oh. <laughs> I heard pastor give a comment back to a guy like that he says you know Ed, as long as, as long as you're here on earth I, I, I'm not the ugliest man in the world that's what he said <laughs> well okay Romans chapter 5 Therefore, I think we have a therefore. Whenever you see a therefore, you act, ask the question, wherefore? Or what is it therefore? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in our, uh-oh, tribulations, Knowing the tribulation, work of patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame. Hope maketh not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Ah, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one man die. Perhaps, for adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God. How many times in the Bible do you see those words, but God? But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Please be seated. It was, uh, it was Mark Twain who said, We're all like the moon. We have a dark side we don't want anyone to see. We're all like the moon. We have a dark side we don't want anyone to see. You know, it's a shame sometimes the dark side comes through. Dr. Albert Schweitzer ministered uh, many years, and he was witnessed to by... Christian pastors and workers, but I think he saw the dark side. And so Schweitzer went to his grave, as far as we know, not knowing Christ as Savior. In fact, he said this, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians are not like your Christ. I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians are not like your Christ. Man. Well, paint the dark side just a little bit. We're God, God picking up the brush of an artist. And he goes to the canvas and he paints a portrait of us, warts and all, warts and all. Well, before we get back to this grim subject, let me start with something funny. I saw the other day, we'll start on the lighter side. It was Pastor John Hagee had a funny little story. He said uh, to his congregation, did you hear about the pastor who had all of his teeth pulled in preparation for his new dentures while they're being worked on? Well, the first Sunday after the extraction, he only preached 10 minutes. The second Sunday, he preached 20 minutes. But on the third Sunday, he preached for an hour and a half. Well, when the congregation questioned him at the door concerning his fluctuation there, this is what he said. The first Sunday, my gums were so sore, I could not hardly talk for more than 10 minutes. And the second Sunday, my new dentures were hurting me a lot, and I only spoke for 20 minutes. But on the third Sunday, I accidentally picked up my wife's dentures. Let me finish the story. <laughs> I knew you would do that. I picked up my wife's dentures and I couldn't stop talking. <clears throat> so if that offends you, I will use the infamous words of our dear pastor. Love you. Okay, we do that. 
And I need to be careful because Sherry can give it right back to me. She, she said once, she said, you know, I have trouble falling asleep. Could you get out one of your sermons and stand at the foot of the bed and just start preaching? God, God for sure put me to sleep, yeah. Well, so anyway, <laughs> so anyway, John Hagee tells that story. And, but if you don't appreciate that, he also went on to say this. He said, we are all faced with a series of opportunities beautifully disguised as unsolvable problems. I need to hear that. You need to hear that. We are all faced with a series of opportunities beautifully disguised as unsolvable problems. Now tell me, have, have you been there? Can you say there have been times in my life where I've, I've said everything I feel is problems, problems, uh, problems. And you come to uh, Romans chapter 5, that doesn't make us feel any better because as over against our chant, uh, problems, 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 uh, Romans 5 says, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. So you're not going to get any comfort there. Um, <clears throat> but if you turn to the back side of your little outline there, everybody get a sheet? Okay. Um, if you turn, you'll see I circled that word three times. Three times. And I'm suggesting that there are three levels of rejoicing. Level one, level two, and level three. So first of all, the first level of rejoicing is this. Rejoicing in hope. Rejoicing in hope. You can jot it down there. Rejoicing in hope. Look at verse 1 again on the back side of your sheet. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace wherein we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You know, all the other versions around us have stolen, used those exact words in their version right out of the King James. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I can't tell you how many times I've quoted that verse, I've thought about it, without asking myself, Bob, do you, what, what does that mean? Have you ever looked at it? Rejoicing in hope. I'm not sure I have it tonight, the answer, but I think it could mean this. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you became, I became, a personal project of the Lord. Uh, I can't imagine God taking you on as a project. I can't believe God taking me on as a project. But I think we're getting close to what it means, the hope of the glory of God, God the master builder, the creator of the universe, uh, makes us his uh, projects. <clears throat> Next month in October, I will have been here at CTK happily for three years. And uh, it's been my privilege to be in many of your homes, just stopping by to say hi, sometimes praying. And I've noticed concerning projects, uh, it doesn't apply to women so much, but it does to men, because they have unfinished projects all over the house, right? And the favorite place to hide them are maybe in the closet or in the garage. And when those projects get to mount uh, to a certain height, you begin to think, you know, I really do need to get back at, to those projects. But you know, God never puts away his projects permanently. Even though some of you may think, I, hey, I've been abandoned. Uh, everybody else is being used of God so greatly, so wonderfully, so frequently, so strategically. And I'm not. God's forgotten me. God's put me on the shelf. Well, <clears throat> may I suggest to you that you can rejoice in the fact that God never stops working on you because part of the project is having you perhaps on that shelf for a while 
where you can cultivate, uh, nurture, and develop, and discover your gifts to be used that are necessary. You know, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will, what? Perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, until he completes his project. You see, this evening, we're talking about hope. And there's an old saying that goes, if it were not for hope, the heart would break. Many of us could identify with that. Without hope, the heart would break. Is that true for any of you here this evening? Uh, let me put it this way. Um, our founding fathers and those that follow them, we think of Jamestown in 1607. But sometimes we don't know the whole story. It wasn't in my history book. They were there in Jamestown for months and uh, maybe a year. And within that year, uh, many people died. Some starved. And here's what we haven't learned. Two fires ripped through that little community. And these people lost their hope. And they got back into those ships that brought them here. They pushed back out of the harbor, uh, extending the sails, hoping for a gust that would bring them on their way back. They've lost hope. But then they saw a friendly ship, skippered by a man by the name of Delaware. And he brought on that ship food, and he brought supplies, and he brought healthy animals. And they began to communicate with that ship. And you know what? Those ships just turned right around in the harbor and came back to where they were in the place they called Jamestown. Well, what happened? Well, I think they got a revival of their hope. Of their hope. Um, I mean it when I say tonight, dear friends, that uh, some of you need to uh, turn around in the harbor, you've got thinking about that vessel, thinking God's finished with me. Uh, I, I'm not a child of grace. I'm a child of wrath. And, but don't forget the quote we heard from Haggai. He said, we're all faced with a series of opportunities beautifully disguised as unsolvable problems. And so I hope you tonight with bulldog tenacity refuse to believe the pessimistic talk of those around you the naysayers the accusers the detractors refuse that and say no I'm I'm committed I'm committed to working and walking hand in hand with my Jesus as he works on his project which happens to be me Amen. And that's the first level, the first level of joy, uh, rejoicing and hope. Somehow we have to reach out and, and, and find that. Thank God for good for Christian friends around us who can pray with us and pray uh, for us. Uh, so you like that part. But hold on. Look at verse 3. Not only so, but we rejoice in our tribulations, our sufferings. That's the second level of rejoicing. Rejoicing in tribulation, rejoicing in sufferings. And I just hear what some may be thinking, listening to this. You say, wait, Bob, and back up the truck. I liked what you said about rejoicing in hope, but it doesn't make sense to rejoice in suffering and tribulation. Only a fool would do that. It's like the old country preacher who said, um, when the good Lord sends tribulation, he specs you, he specs you to tribulate a little bit. And so we tribulate. Sometimes we say, God, I'm tribulating, just leave me alone. Or my friends at CTK, I'm, I'm tribulating a little bit right now, just, just, just leave me alone. I, I've gone through that too. After that whole hospital experience, everything was jumbled up, and my best friend would say, you know, you never want to get with me. Uh, you know, remember, Bob, when we used to just have a great time? 
and you keep saying no. I said, Barry, I'm just not, um, I'm just not with, with it yet. I, I'm tribulating, really. And, and maybe I shouldn't have been. I lived in fear for, for months. Every time I came out of the house, I'd look behind trees just to see. Because we didn't know for two years later who did it and why. And the why was he was so drunk he didn't even remember getting in. And so I confess I had to live in a little bit of fear. Uh, Barry, I'm tribulating a bit now. Uh, maybe I'll get back to you. Well, you know, we say this. God says in the midst of that, he said, I don't expect you to tribulate. <laughs> I expect you to rejoice. And we say, yeah, right. Yeah, right. How, how do you do that? How do you, easy to say, how do you do that? Well, it's by knowing something. Look at verse 2. And we rejoice in our sufferings, in our tribulation, knowing something. We rejoice in our sufferings and tribulations knowing something. All right. I want to show you a picture of a road here on the screen, a couple roads. And I want to say this sentence real carefully. If I am told, if I am told that where I am going is connected between where I am and where I'm going by a very rough road... If I'm told that, then every jolt along the way, every bump along the way is used to tell me that I'm on the right road. I didn't say that. F.B. Myers said it. But isn't that great? If I'm told that the destination where I'm going is connected between where I am and where I'm going by a very rough road, then every jolt and bump along the way reminds me I'm on the right road. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, um, here's what the Lord says to me. Bob, I've got your good at hand. And my reputation is at stake too. You're my sheep. I know where you're going. You don't, but I do. Now, Bob, in the light of my plan for your life, there will be some dark, deep valleys and chasms that you may have to go through, and you can't explain. You just can't explain. They defy logic. Some of you tonight are going through things that you cannot explain. We don't talk about those things much, even over coffee. But you're going through some things that you just can't understand. It's like uh, unscrewing the inscrutable. We quote the verse all the time that, that uh, you know, Jesus and the Lord, uh, his ways are higher than our ways. How can we find them out? We read the verse and then we go right on to try to figure it out. And sometimes it, it's just the inscrutable God. That's why James Dobson Many years ago, I think it was probably 30 years by now, uh, Dobson wrote that book. And um, when, when God doesn't make sense, when God doesn't make sense, it's a great book. You can get it at the Goodwill for a quarter. Uh, when God doesn't make sense. Uh, that's why I've entitled this message tonight, Difficult Circumstances. Difficult Circumstances. Ah, but you know, you know what I think of all the time? I always think back to that great movie and Broadway play, Fiddler on the Roof, which has played in New York for years and years. And I often think of Tevya, the milkman there, saddling up his horse, driving the cart full of milk deliveries, and the horse gets a, a bum leg, and he has to do it himself. And so Tevya straps on the harness on himself and he begins to pull that milk wagon. And as the sweat is dropping off his leathery face, he says, God, I know that we are the chosen people. But once in a while, couldn't you choose somebody else? 
And sometimes we feel that. God, I go to church every Sunday. I pay my tithe. I teach a class. <sighs> Doesn't that count for something? Doesn't that count for something? Uh, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But look at verse 3 in the middle of the verse. It says we can uh, examine ourselves here because we know that suffering or tribulation produces perseverance or patience. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, and sometimes I don't like it when we use Greek in a sermon. It, you know, can try to make us look good and all that. But I think sometimes you do have to put it in. Like, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? A pastor preached on that. Sometimes you have to use it. But here, here is a $10 word that expresses what is this perseverance or patience. The word is hupomeno. Hupomeno, and it means to abide under, to be steady. It's the word for stability. Um, some of you tonight are abiding with a load. You are uh, hupomeno. You are underneath that load. Now, a man writes these words. He says, as a little boy... Our family loved to go to the little town then of Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, it was the farm of an old guy named Cletus Carroll. And he was a cotton farmer, and we loved to go there because he had horses in the barn, and we kids liked to, to get on horses, and we had one that we really liked. His name was Sugar. What a great name for that sweet horse. And uh, we, we rode on him, and we'd be bouncing around and poking and everything else. But that sugar just kept going along under the load. Hupo meno. Hupo meno. I wrote a note to one of our members uh, yesterday. And I concluded by saying, man, to this guy, just soldier on. You know, we're doing all we know to do. We're praying. You're, you're living the Christian life. We see it. But soldier on. Sometimes you just need to hupomeno. And that's exactly the word for perseverance or patience. It's abiding under the load. That's an amazing thing. Um, but what this perseverance is like as we try and we don't want to be like that horse sugar we want to be and we are like the wild spaniel the uh, horse that needs to be broken and and when you put something on our back a harness or something that restricts us our nostrils get wide and um, our eyes open up because we don't like what somebody's trying to do to us. In submission, we're not like that horse sugar. Now, if you are going through some of that tonight, this may help you. Annie Johnson Flint, I know some of you ladies have read her. She wrote down these words. She said, pressed out of measure and pressed to all strength. Pressed so intensely, it seems beyond length. Pressed in the body and pressed in the soul. Pressed in the mind till the dark surges roll. Pressure by foes and pressure by friends. And pressure on pressure till life nearly ends. But pressed into loving his staff and his rod. Pressed into knowing no helper but God. Pressed into liberty where nothing clings. Pressed into faith for impossible things. Pressed into living a life in the Lord. Pressed into living the Christ life outpoured. Friends, that was written by a veteran, not by a rookie. In the faith. You can't say that as a rookie. You just can't. You will someday. Keep coming to church. Keep fellowshipping. So, you know what I believe? 
I believe <clears throat> we have to make pictures or statues or something to the thing that we have been cursing. Make a monument to the very thing that we have been cursing all these days. The pastor told a great story a couple of Wednesdays ago, and I was sitting there saying, oh man, he told the story, and I can't use it now, but it's a great story. The pastor told it a few weeks ago. And it's about a little, little southern town that was involved in cotton growing, and that was their prosperity. I mean, they were made quite well off by cotton farming. Well, the bull weevil came along, and uh, before long, he devastated. Those things devastated the cotton crop and just about put everybody into a poorhouse. But farmers, ingenious lot that they are, simply took a breath and said, well, we'll plant peanuts. And you know something? It brought in more money than they ever would have made by cotton farming. And you know what they did? You know how they celebrated that disaster that turned into blessing? They actually made a monument and put it in the town square in the middle of their town in the shape of uh, the bull weevil. The shape of the very thing that just about took their lives. I, uh, I, I, I have this on my door and I put a couple extra copies, and, you know, five or six copies. And it says this, I have served the Lord so long that I can hardly tell the difference between a blessing and a trial. Think about that. I've served the Lord so long, I can hardly tell the difference. This thing's coming upon me, it looks bad, but I can't really tell the difference because, you know, God typically will turn those things around. So if, if you want one, I put a few sheets up here. But that's exactly what those cotton farmers did. They turned it around. They made a mon monument to the thing that was destroying them. And that little southern town is prosperous even to this day. So Richard Sumi of Dallas Seminary said this, all things work together for good for the Christian, even the bull weevil experience. You know, sometimes we settle into kind of a humdrum, monotonous life. You know, like doing cotton every year. And uh, God sends the bull weevil and shakes us out of that groove. And, and we must find a new way to live. A new way to live. Financial reverses, great bereavement, physical infirmities, loss of a friend. How many of us with those things, how many of us have been driven to produce a finer crop, a better crop, because of those things that came upon me? I'd like to see your hands. If you can say, yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, some things in my life look bad, but oh my goodness, I have no idea. Yes, man, isn't that true? Well, that's the bull weevil. And, um, but without that, you see, we would still possibly be a cotton sharecropper. And so I thank God this evening for the hard, harsh, abrasive, Things that raked across my life and absolutely pulled out everything underneath me, things that I was hanging on to, pulled it all away until I had nothing left except Jesus. Some of you have been right there. You've lost it all. You, you have Jesus. You have Jesus. I heard someone say this week, you know, if you have one, one good friend, many times that one friend will keep you alive and well, and uh, even miles away from a suicide, which uh, one of our uh, friends
friends here tonight had to deal with last week with the suicide of, uh, I think it was an uncle. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? Well, but one friend can maybe help you through, and plus God. My dad used to say, one plus God is a majority. One plus God is a majority. And so Paul closes this passage in verse 11 by saying, not only this, but we rejoice in God. Amen. Who's working on the project. Amen. Yeah, amen or oh me. He's doing that. You know the prelates in Rome, years ago, the Catholic people, uh, the prelates didn't know what was in uh, Michelangelo's mind when he was uh, doing all those carvings. They'd float those big hunks of uh, marble down the river, drag them across the desert, stand them up, and Michelangelo would be chip, 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 and uh, pieces were falling, and uh, the Catholics began to say, you know, hey, uh, we don't think we're getting our money's worth. Uh, leave some of that in the rock, you know. In fact, one priest yelled out, look, look, all this waste. To which Michelangelo responded, as the chips fall, the image emerges. As the chips fall, the image emerges. And I know there are some tonight that could preach a sermon right, right there. Don't like the chips, but as they fall, the image emerges. And so, friend, I think that's what's happening in some of your lives. But, but others are, are focusing on the chips, um, the things that they call loss, but God is focusing on the end result. And that's why the passage ends in verse 11. Not only so, but we rejoice in God. Amen. Who has the perfect plan. Who has the perfect plan. Three quick thoughts and then we'll pray. Number one, the secret of rejoicing is having the right focus. The secret is having the right focus. It really is. Uh, if you focus on the chips that fall, uh, you're not going to be happy. You're, you're going to be long-faced. You're going to be sad. You're going to be bitter, not better. And you're not going to be a good testimony to those outside. It's all in the focus. Which leads us to the second lesson, which is this. The willingness to focus means having the right attitude. Having the right attitude. You say, well, man, that sounds good. I'd like to do that. Uh, well... Do that right now. Remembering that Billy Graham said forever that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% our reaction to it. 10% and then 90 how we react to it. So it requires a teachable attitude. One that's humble enough to say, Lord, I've made a mess here. Please take over. And I will be grateful for even the bull weevil, if you should send that into my life. And then number three, the result of a right attitude is an unquenchable optimism, an unquenchable... <sighs> Visiting Mary the other day, she said, you know, I try to smile my best, I teach a little Bible class here, and people often comment on on the smile, you know, just, uh, and, and that brings me to my favorite story with which I will quit. My favorite story concerns Phillips Brooks, a pastor that lived a number of years ago working up in the Boston area. The people loved him just like we, we love our pastor. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. We, we just love the guy and his family and Jill who picks out all his clothes you know well they loved Phillips Brooks and they would line up in the snow on a Saturday morning just to get a brief minute or two with Phillips Brooks 
One day, a guy was standing in line with his buddy, and the fellow said, I just have to talk to Dr. Brooks. I have a question. I have a question for Dr. Brooks. I just have to get there and ask that question. Well, finally, he gets in. And when he comes out, his friend sees just a great smile on his face. And he says, oh, I presume you got to ask Dr. Brooks that question. And I presume that he gave you a, a good, satisfactory answer. And the man said, you know, I don't think I needed so much an answer to a question, but the contagion of a triumphant spirit. Yes. What I needed was not so much an answer to my question, but the contagion of a triumphant spirit. And folks, you and I ought to be tri triumphant because we are the only people that ought to smile, that ought to rejoice. We are the only people that have the answer to life. And we can be just that. <laughs> Someone defined uh, this unquenchable optimism this way. Optimism is a man in a canoe going after Moby Dick with a jar of tartar, tartar sauce by his side. <laughs> that's, that's optimism right there. Well, let's stand uh, for prayer. Um, and uh, let's see. I, you know, I, I, I've never read a prayer in my life. You know, you make your own prayers. But I wrote down a prayer tonight. It, it's not my prayer. But it's just about three sentences. And I like it. It's a prayer that I don't even know who wrote it. And so we're bowing our heads. And, and let's just pray this prayer. Lord, Lord, keep me still. Keep me still, those stormy winds may blow, and waves my little boat may overflow. Or even if in the darkness I must go, keep me still, keep me still. Lord, keep me still, the winds are in thy hand. The roughest winds subside at thy command. Steer thou my boat in safety to the land and keep me still. Keep me still. And dear Lord, we sometimes use too many words in our prayers. We need to listen more. Just listen more as we fall off to sleep at night, as we're mowing the lawn. Just, we need to hear from you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of being with this group of people that are just the finest group I've ever seen. Keep them strong. And Lord, we, we have heavy hearts for those that are dealing with just issues that can't be felt by us. So help us, Lord, when we see them. Saturday coming in, Sunday coming in. Help us to be that smile of encouragement that they need and we need and we can do it. And uh, we pray this name, pray this thing in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, your dollar up front. There's a couple little uh, colorful things. I think I have about half a dozen of them. Cool things to put on your door. You know, I've been a Christian so long that I can hardly tell the difference between, you know, a blessing and a trial.